Hello and welcome in this short session about the Roman radiographic anatomy of the abdomen in the dog and cat. My name is Pete Mantis and in the next few minutes we will go through the various abdominal organs and how they appear normally radiographically. <laughs> Most people haven't realized that we don't always see all the organs, all the structures in the abdomen. Structures we commonly see include the stomach, liver, urinary bladder, small intestine, and colon, especially the descending colon. Structures that we only see partially includes the spleen, especially in cats, it's not so often visible, and usually it's visible when it is big. Kidneys, they may not be clearly visible, and that is fine, and the prostate gland. Other that we seldom, if ever, see other organs are the pancreas, the adrenal glands that in cats can be mineralized so basically they may be able to be seen normally because in cats mineralization can be normal of the adrenals while in dogs is bad news, the ovaries and the mesenteric lymph nodes. So these are organs that we seldom see unless they are abnormal. Starting with the liver, the liver is cranioventrally and normally is within the rib cage, and that is an important factor. Another important factor is the caudal edge of the liver is quite pointy, if you like, quite sharp. And the measurement we can use is the gastric axis, bringing a line from the fundus to the pylorus. This should be from vertical to the spine up to parallel to the ribs. So as long as this axis is within this, so we go a line from the fundus to the pylorus, that will be the gastric axis, and then this should be from vertical up to parallel within that angle, that is usually normal. Now if the liver margin extends beyond the rib cage but is still sharp, consider the possibility of a very inspiratory radiograph, not necessarily a very big liver. The spleen, we see the tail of the spleen is usually ventrally, very commonly in the dog, triangularly, or if you have a video or a DV view, it may be seen behind the stomach on the left hand side, the head of the spleen. In cats, rarely we see that, and usually, if we see it, it's just usually splenomegaly, though uh, newer information indicates that we can see it also in normal cats without any splenomegaly. The stomach, the Appearance varies according to dependency. Remember, the stomach is like a J. If that is dorsal, that's ventral, that's left, and that's right. And air always goes up. So if the animal is on his back, all the air will come down here. If the animal is on the right side, all the air will go on the left. So in the fundus and the body. If the animal lies on the ventral aspect, all the air will go dorsally, so in the fundus. Or if it lies on the left, all the air will go actually to the right, the pylorus. So it depends how it lies and how much air we have in there, we may see it. Here we have a right lateral view, so most of the air goes to the left. So fundus and body of the stomach. Sometimes it's useful to identify a torsion like that. Usually it doesn't go beyond the last rib, and that is our rule of the thumb. Sometimes you get a question like, where do we cut the limit? When do we stop calling the stomach full of something and we call it dilated? And that is the last rib. So if the stomach extends beyond the last rib, then this is dilated. The pyloric antrum is near to the midline and to the right of the dog or in the cat is mostly on the midline on the ventrodorsal view. Small intestine, we can see it all over. Individual segments cannot be identified. Okay, normally we measure the diameter, and the diameter of the small intestine cannot be wider than the height of a mid lumbar vertebra or twice the width of the rib. So, small intestine less than height of body of mid lumbar vertebrae or less than twice the width of the rib. In the cat it should be more than 12 millimeter 
or the central part of the L4. So we can measure this is a cut here. We can see how the line comes away, uh, how the vertebrae look like. We measure seven, uh, six, five, four. Measure the height of the body, and this small intestine should be less like it is in this example. Large intestine, the cecum is C-shaped. Usually, we sit at the level of about L3. Okay. You can see it here is C-shaped. So if you see it, don't worry. It is small in the tag in the cut and it's commonly not visible radiographically. The normal colon, which usually we can see at the back, the descending colon, is not more in diameter than the length of L7. Something to use if in doubt. Okay, here we can actually see as the colon goes back, should be more than that. We have contrast studies to help us, especially with the stomach and the intestine, especially barium solo for upper GI tract, barium enema for the colon. We don't normally do them now because they are messy and because now we have other techniques like CT. And of course, double contrast, especially for the stomach to see the actual uh, surface of the mucosa. We get information with contrast about the location, wall thickness, and motility. Don't forget, it's very tricky to evaluate the wall thickness on a survey radiograph because fluid in the lumen or soft tissue ingesta may silhouette with the wall give the wrong impression of thickness. So for that you need contrast or another technique like ultrasound or CT to provide you more information. But you can certainly measure how dilated it looks. Kidneys not normally seen, ureter normally not seen. So for the kidneys, Dorsal retroperitoneal in the dog is between the 13th thoracic and second lumbar in the cut between the first and fourth lumbar, while the left kidney is second to fourth lumbar in the dog, that's level second to five in the cut. Now we can measure on the ventrodorsal view the length of the second lumbar vertebrae, and in the dog it's two and a half to three and a half, while in the cut is 1.8 to 2.4 but only on the ventrodorsal view. Don't confuse and do it in any other view. You will get wrong results. Ureters, we don't normally see them, but if they are dilated or they have a calculi, we may see part of the ureters. Of course, we can see them with contrast studies. We will see like an intravenous urogram or as it's called excretory urogram, in which case we would contrast in the vein. And initially we can see like here immediately and in five minutes, the kidneys it grow it a little bit better, highlight it. We can start seeing now in the five minutes the ureters as they come down. And later on, we can follow and see them as they enter into the bladder. So that helps us identify the renal pelvis that should be small, the ureters and the bladder. And the number to remember is usually two millimeters. The renal pelvis should be up to two millimeters in diameter, and the ureter up to two millimeters in diameter, the wall thickness of the urinary bladder up to two millimeters if the bladder is full, not if it is empty. Now the bladder is discrete soft tissue opacity. It's further on the back. We can actually see it's cranial to the pubis, ventral to the rectum and descending colon. The urethra, we don't normally see them in survey radiographs again. For the urethra, we will need contrast. And here is a cystogram. We can see a positive contrast. So we filled it with iodine contrast and a double contrast cystogram. Don't forget the wall should not be more than 2 millimeters in a full uh, urinary bladder. Retrograde urethrogram to see actually the urethra as it goes in and vagina urethrogram in females. You see the folic after here. We fill the vagina and then the urethra and that is how they should appear normally. The prostate is dorsal to the pubis, ventral to the lectum and depends on the bladder position. Initially, it's within the pelvic canal, so it's a little bit trickier. Three, four years comes more cranially into the peritoneal cavity. And one rule of the thumb you can use is that the size of the prostate should be less than two thirds of the pelvic inlet, or if you like, 
less than 70% the distance between the pubic rim and the sacral promontory. Okay, so check the pelvis, roughly two thirds, prostate should be less than that. If more than that, it is big. Uterus and ovaries, we don't see them on survey radiographs, in, especially in a non gravid female. If it is pregnant, of course, we see the uterus, or if it is abnormal, as dilated, we even see the skeleton scenes. In obese dogs and cats, because they have a lot of fat, and as we know, fat is a little bit less than soft tissue, we may be seen on a lateral survey radiograph. But that is the exception. Thank you again for your time going through the abdominal organs, and I hope you find this small video helpful for you. Thank you.